Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Karina Kraminski grew up in Australia. She studied politics and fine arts when she was at university and she attended Spanish speaking in Ukrainian churches as this is her cultural heritage. After graduating, she went back to Argentina, the land of her birth, to teach English as a second language. She also became a foreign correspondent. Today, she lectures in missional studies at Morling Theological College in Sydney, Australia. She trains people for church planting and for pastoral ministry. Her doctorate's in missional spirituality, and she's passionate about seeing people engage in the mission of God, develop deep spiritual roots, and see what it means to combine missional spirituality with an active missional presence in the world. Recently you did a public lecture on uh, mission and the reign of God. Mm -hmm. In that public lecture you talked about gender being a broken characteristic in humanity. What do you mean by that? So um, I'm really just simply reminding people to include gender um, mm. when we talk about uh, the brokenness in this mm. world. So Christians believe that uh, God created this world good and then it was mm. broken uh, through sin. Uh, and that, that affects everything. Uh, it affects nature, it affects, um, it affects uh, humanity. Um, and I'm just reminding people simply that uh, it affects um, gender. And so when we see examples of uh, violence between uh, the genders, power, power struggles, um, division, uh, when we see men perpetrating violence against women, when we see women being unhealthily submissive uh, mm -hmm. towards men. Mm -hmm. We see some of those dynamics <clears throat> being played out. Um, for me, that's an indication that gender is, is an aspect, uh, is a, uh, something that's created uh, that is, that's been marred by sin, mm -hmm. uh, that is broken. So it's, been, it's a good thing, gender is a good thing, mm -hmm. that's created by God, but it is uh, broken in the same way that um, that our world is broken. So I'm really simply reminding people to include mm. gender when they think about the brokenness of this universe. And our hope, of course, is that in Christ mm. all things are reconciled, and so that includes gender. Mm. Gender, some of the difficulties we see around gender, that, that can be reconciled um, through mm. Christ. Mm. When you see the brokenness of gender relationships and of gender, do you see it manifesting itself in the same ways in the church as you see in society? Or are there different kinds of manifestations? I think sometimes we um, pick up a lot from, we take a lot from the cultural narratives in, in our society. Um, so I, I, generally speaking, I think, particularly in Australian society, I still think we are quite conservative where it comes to gender. Um, I think if we compare it to the US, I think there's a little bit more this is my opinion, there's a little bit more um, progress there, whereas here I think we're still battling maybe what you call a little bit of a, a blokey culture. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, the um, domestic violence has been an issue lately in, in the press and uh, it's, it's a lot of people campaigning against it and bringing it up mm -hmm. to light that it is an issue. And for me, that that's evidence of issues around, around gender. Mm -hmm. um, so... Oh, was your yeah, I was wondering oh. about yeah whether it manifests itself the same way in the church as it does yeah, in society. So I think we, um, yeah. we do take from society a lot. It does mm. influence um, the church mm. uh, quite a bit. Of course, within the church, we wrap it in a, in a mm. theology. Um, mm. We look at the Bible and we say, well, this justifies um, some of the ways that we are behaving. So mm. we actually need to critique that um, mm. a little bit more. So I think we mm. take a little bit too much from society. Mm. We, need, we need a different narrative. Yeah, you mentioned uh, cultural narratives. How do we go about identifying and critiquing dominant cultural narratives that relate to gender? Yeah, so for me it requires um, a good amount of cultural yeah. exegesis. So yeah. really looking at some of the cultural narratives that do exist in our society, uh, identifying what they are, and simply means, I think, um, identifying what, what gives value to people's yeah. lives, um, what creates meaning in their lives. Um, so. Um, one narrative that we can see in our society today, for example, I think, um, is a consumerist uh, narrative. You know, I, I buy, therefore I am. Uh, it seems to give people a lot of meaning um, in life. Um, and so we need to look at some of those narratives that we are living by, and, and we're all affected by those narratives, even Christians, and uh, critique those narratives in light of a kingdom of God uh, narrative and see how those cultural narratives need to um, be subverted 
by the kingdom of God. Mm. Sometimes they need to be rejected because mm. the kingdom of God is against some of those cultural narratives that we are living by. Uh, sometimes they can be affirmed, but I do think we need to be doing a lot more critiquing of um, what story we are living, and what gives mm. meaning to our lives, um, and make sure that it actually is in line with the kingdom of God narrative mm. as opposed to another narrative um, that we might be living. We need to be different um, mm. to our world. Mm. What does the Kingdom of God perspective on gender look like? So for me, um, the way that I describe uh, the Kingdom of God is it's an alternate uh, reality um, that runs in parallel to the reality that we see before us. And while we may not be able to say of the Kingdom of God, well, there it is, geographically mm. located, I can point it to you, I can point it out to you, I think we can see signs and indications of this alternate reality uh, invading mm. Uh, our universe and so for me signs of the kingdom when it breaks through um, we see uh, justice we see uh, salvation we see beauty we see truth um, we see um, servanthood uh, coming through all of those all of those values come through I think for me in the, in the, uh, in the kingdom of God um, reality and so if we put gender into that then I'd say that the kingdom of God perspective on gender looks at gender and thinks about how we can, for example, bring um, servanthood um, into mm. the, the battle that occurs between men and women, mm. how we can um, think about reconciliation mm. um, when it comes to some of the divisions between um, men and women, how we can speak life and truth into gender confusion that, that we see um, these days, um, how we can bring beauty and and justice uh, uh, into into the issue of gender. So a kingdom of God perspective of, um, on gender brings in some of the values of the kingdom of God into um, some of the core issues that we're looking at um, in gender. Um, so uh, to me, that that means thinking about things like mutual submission, um, also relationality uh, as well. So I think we can um, we can think a lot about how. The Trinity uh, works, how the three persons uh, relate to one another in the Godhead. Uh, they are continually um, submitting to one another. They are in a joyful relationship. They are in a mutual relationship. And for me, um, well, I know that that is on my shaky ground here, but for me, I think we can model that um, to some extent um, in our, the way we do community, the way that we relate to one another as men and women. Um, so that's also the value, the value of you know, mutuality, relationality that we can bring into a kingdom of God perspective mm. on, on gender. Mm. I know you're um, passionate about missional studies as well. I wonder how some of these ideas translate into shaping a outward missional posture. <coughs> uh, how do these ideas affect things like our relationship to domestic violence or yeah. other sorts of issues relating to sexuality and gender? Yeah. I think we need to be more vocal mm. and more on top of things mm. as Christians. I think we're letting um, we're letting the world lead us um, at the moment, which which is mm. fine. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, activism at the moment around a lot of media attention. It's mm. quite fashionable to talk about domestic violence, and that's great. Anything that raises it to the surface is fine. But as Christians, we always need to be on top of this. We need to be the first ones to believe women when they say that they are victims of domestic violence, as opposed to, um, as some church leaders have said, it, it doesn't really exist um, to the extent that people say that it does. That, that's really marginalising um, women who, who are going through some really difficult times. And so we need to be um, defending um, these women. We need to be the first ones um, to, to come to their help. Um, we need to be the first ones to be um, talking about these issues and standing up um, mm. for, for women, for example, who are going through domestic violence. So mm. I just think we need to be leaders in some of these areas as opposed to letting um, the world guide us, even though mm. that, that can be fine too. But we have a, a, a unique contribution we can put forward, this kingdom of God ideal. We, while we might not you know, convey it as a kingdom of God ideal, people will recognise that it's something, it's something from another world and it's good. Mm. Um, we need to be um, speaking that out. Um, yeah. yeah, that's helpful. Um, 
people don't often think about the church being at the forefront of mm. gender discussions and discussions mm. about sexuality. So mm. I can see how beginning to sort of take the bull by the horns and uh, think these issues through proactively could be quite helpful for us. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I think usually when people think about the church, uh, they think of something that is an institution mm. that is old-fashioned mm. and, and even um, backwards in the way mm. that the church views women. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. Um, there is an old book. Yeah, it doesn't mm. have to be that way. Mm. Now you've done a doctorate in missional spirituality yeah. and probably some other, other things in there as well. Yeah. Um, how does a missional spirituality look different than other forms of Christian spirituality? What does it look like? Okay. So a missional spirituality um, is based on missional theology. So mm. it's just uh, thinking about the concept of the Missio Dei, um, that, that God is on mission and thinking about, we, we uh, worship a God who, who is on mission and who is missional, and that we as a church need to be shaped by that Missio Dei. Um, and so um, Bosch, uh, missiologist uh, Bosch, uh, talks a lot about um, uh, the church being shaped by the Missio Dei as opposed to doing missional acts. And I, I really agree with that. I think that um, we, we're talking about being missional, we need to be shaped as a missional people as opposed to being a people who do missional acts. Mm. And so spirituality, missional spirituality comes into that because it is all about how we are shaped into missional Christians who are on God's mission, who are seen as the sent ones um, of God. And so um, in that sense, missional spirituality perhaps challenges traditional interpretations of spirituality. So uh, traditional spirituality can be seen sometimes as very inward oriented, um, also very individualistic, as well sometimes perhaps even with a consumeristic tendency. So mm. taking spiritual disciplines and enacting them so, so that I'm, it's good for me. Mm. Um, uh, it has a tendency for withdrawal. Uh, so missional spirituality is about engagement uh, with mm. the world. It is about a spirituality that, um, that is practiced as we live our lives. It is a spirituality that uh, is relational as opposed mm. to individualistic and very much um, others oriented. Mm. Uh, so it's very, very outwards uh, mm. focused. Yeah. Is contemplation connected with engagement in the world or are they two very separate types of things? Yeah, I think um, rather than and dichotomizing the two mm. things, we can bring them together. Mm. So uh, it is a spirituality, so we are uh, I think, talking about um, engaging with uh, the Holy Spirit, thinking about what God is saying to us, thinking about how to discern uh, the presence of God and how to hear his voice. Mm. So that does require uh, reflection. It does require uh, stepping back. So I don't think it, we need to um, dichotomize the two things and say one is better than the other. We need we need the two things. But I think what is true is that traditionally spirituality has been interpreted in a more contemplative way. Um, and we just need to bring back um, the idea that spirituality is also about engagement um, with the world. Um, so it's the two things. It's not just not just the one. And I think that's the unique contribution that missional spirituality brings into the whole topic of spiritual formation and I think it's a healthy thing. Hmm. I've, I've heard you um, teach on this area a few times and you talk about uh, four characteristics, I think, of missional spirituality, incarnational, spirit, spirit-filled, Trinitarian and canonic. What do you mean by those terms and how do they affect missional spirituality? Okay. How long is this interview? <laughs> <laughs> They're four big terms, I know. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so spirit-led is... is uh... You know, the technical term that I've used mm. is humanological, which is really uh, just looking at um, the emphasis of the Spirit in, in missional theology. And uh, some would say that the Holy Spirit has been marginalised in, in missional theology. Yeah. We've had a very high Christology and mm. marginalised the Holy Spirit, um, and, and that doesn't have to be the way. Um, so thinking about uh, not only how the Holy Spirit uh, forms and reforms the church, but how the Holy Spirit is active in our world. Mm. And I think mm. Christians have always been quite ambivalent about mm. 
the world as a place for the spirit's activity. Mm. I think Christians have often seen the world as a place that you go to to do your missional activity. Yeah. Uh, but instead of that, I wonder if we could see that we go to the world to do our missional activity knowing that God is already at work yeah. in the world. His spirit is already there and what we need to do is discern what he's up to and connect mm. with what he's doing. So in that sense, mm. um, uh, uh, pneuma, pneumatology or being spirit-led is mm. a missional characteristic mm. and it's something that we can practice. We discern mm. uh, what the spirit of God is up to. Um, with kenosis, um, coming from Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, which talks about how Christ emptied himself. Mm. Um, often we look at that passage and we worship, uh, and that's what we should do. Uh, Christ mm. emptied himself for me. He gave himself up for me. I will worship this God. Uh, but I think it's also a call for us to imitate what he has done. Uh, and so we need to be people who are kenotic. We need to be people who live a cruciform life. So we are shaped mm. by the cross and the resurrection. It's not just that we worship this God who did this. Of course we do. But we also imitate um, yeah. Christ who did that. And so living a cruciform life is a part of being mm. um, a missional Christian. Mm. It avoids, it stops us from compartmentalising our lives. Our whole mm. lives are to be cruciform. Um, and so another characteristic is uh, Trinitarian. And so... Um, looking at how the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit relate to one another, so looking at the dynamics of the Godhead. And once again, we're talking about the mystery of God here, so we need to be careful. But I like um, being able to take Trinitarian theology from an abstract realm and thinking about how we can apply it to mm. our lives. And I think one mm. way that we can cautiously apply it is we can think about if the Father, Son and Holy Spirit is in such deep, intimate, mutual relationship with one another, how can we live that out as a mm. community? So once again, we're looking at the theology and we are applying it mm. um, to our daily lives as, mm. as church. And um, with incarnational, of course, it points to God uh, being made flesh and uh, we can never uh, imitate that. That is a unique, uh, something unique that happened. Uh, but we can, I think, be people who flesh out or um, embody the gospel. Mm. So Leslie Newbigin fa famously said that um, uh, the church is uh, the hermeneutic of the gospel. And uh, I think I think that's right there. I mm. think, you know, as we flesh out, as we incarnate, as we live out this gospel, um, we become an apologetic of uh, mm. this world. This world looks mm. at us and thinks, all right, that's what the gospel is. I get it now. Um, so we're incarnating, not in the way that um, God um, put on flesh, but we are living out the gospel mm. um, with Christ's um, hands and feet in this world. So, um, so you've got some missional theology there, and from those missional theology characteristics, uh, you can, uh, I believe, we can um, practically apply those characteristics mm. in our lives so that we are formed um, by the Missio Day. So they're mm. formed into missional Christians. Mm. In your personal experience and in your engagement with communities, what are some of the practices that cultivate a missional spirituality? Yeah, um, there's, there are a lot. Mm. Um, however, there are a few that I've tried that have worked uh, for me uh, and um, I encouraged a group of people uh, from my church to engage in these particular practices. And uh, there, there was definitely a missional shift that happened there. Uh, so the four practices that I encouraged them, encouraged them to um, engage in. Firstly, uh, uh, I asked them to pray with their eyes open uh, every day. So once again, different to usual spirituality, where we are encouraged to go into a private place, withdraw and pray, shut our eyes. I'm encouraging them to pray with their eyes open, perhaps as they're driving to work, or, um, or sitting at a cafe, just praying as they're looking at their environment. And a lot of them said that that helped them feel more connected to their locality. Um, in, in that sense, they were incarnational because they were connecting to their neighbourhoods. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were seeing what was going on and God was prompting them to pray about what was going on rather than praying about what's going on in their internal, in their mm. lives. Um, 
Another practice was uh, reading scripture uh, in a public place. And so once again, against the whole concept of withdrawing, uh, sitting in a cafe or a park, looking at what's going on around you and reading a passage of scripture and seeing how that applies to what is going on around you. And uh, this worked for some people, for some people it didn't. Some people were quite uh, still, still caught up in the idea that we need to be silent in order to reflect on what the Bible is mm -hmm. saying to us. And so they found it a bit distracting. Um, I find it a very helpful uh, practice. So I've read scripture before while looking at the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House and the city and, and, and was really challenged by what God was saying to me, to me about the city of mm -hmm. Sydney. Um, so I think that's one way that we can connect with our yeah. environment more yeah. and, and, in, in, and practice um, being spirit-led because we're discerning what God is up to um, around us. Uh, another practice was to engage in radical acts of hospitality uh, at least once a week. So this is identifying somebody who's marginalised, um, somebody who's struggling and just blessing them with a word or a service or an act of kindness. Um, and so this really pushed people out of their comfort zones. Uh, when, when we practice this as a group. Um, this was to think about how we can be canonic, how we can live a cruciform life and, and, and take risks, um, stepping out of our comfort zone, and really thinking about others rather than ourselves. And so we had people in the group um, doing things like you know, buying cups of coffee for homeless people, yeah. and, um, buying baked goods for people who, who look after the trolleys in supermarkets, yeah. and. It was really, really good. There was definitely a shift that happened. I don't, I don't know if, um, if that shift was long term, but mm. there was definitely a, a movement towards being visual mm. that occurred after practicing mm. those, mm. those um, disciplines. Mm. Those if I wanted to investigate more about missional spirituality, what are some authors and books that have helped you? Yeah, well, um, Craig uh, Van Gelder has written quite a bit on mm. uh, missional spirituality. Uh, there's also a great book by um, Roger uh, Helland. Yeah. Uh, his um, book on mm. it's called Missional Spirituality. It's just um, mm. it's fabulous. Uh, it, it really puts forward a very um, um, very concrete um, concrete theology and also practices mm. around um, missional spirituality. Um, Barry Jones has also just mm. written a book called Dwell. I think it's called Dwell. Mm. And that is also very good in terms of how we can practice um, our spirituality. Um, also, I think looking to the past helps a lot as well. I think exploring Celtic um, spirituality, they had a very integrated view of spirituality. There was none of this retreating to, to, to commune with God in, in silence, which, which is fine. But um, they, they engaged with the world. They had prayers for everything, prayers for lighting fires and prayers for you know, when you cut your finger after chopping something, they had prayers for everything. It was prayers during your daily life. Um, so looking to, to the past, I think, is very helpful as well. Um, I also really like um, sort of Benedict's rule. Uh, I think some people would say that's not missional, but, but I, I think um, what, what uh, the Benedictines tried to do is just really um, form community through, through practices. And I think that is helpful for a... Um, a mission of spirituality. Mm. So looking to the past, I think, helps as well. But I think this is, um, I, I sort of think we're on new ground here. I think there's more that can be written, that can mm. be said about this topic. And I think if we bring in the perspective of um, the majority world, uh, I think as well that that's really helpful. Um, they have a very robust um, new ontology in mm. a lot of majority, in a lot of majority mm. world countries. Mm. And I think listening to their voices can really shape us um, and help us as well. Mm. Mm. Corinna, thank you for joining us at Being Missional. Oh, no worries, thank you. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities, and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.